Hey folks, welcome to this guide for the any% percent speedrun of X-Men 2 for Sega Genesis. I'll be starting with an overview of characters used, their abilities, and general game mechanics. After that, I'll touch on strategies and tips for each of the 22 levels. Alright, here we go. Nightcrawler will be your primary character for the run, as he has incredible movement options. As I mentioned, we'll start with the basics. Nightcrawler Basic Movement Jump height is determined by how long you hold the button, and you have fine control over your momentum in the air. A double jump can be performed by pressing jump a second time up until you reach the peak of your first jump, and to get maximum height you will want to double jump near the peak. While maximum height double jumps are crucial at a few key spots in the run, you will likely be using quick, low height double jumps much more frequently, as you receive a small speed boost when you double jump, and it can be used to properly space for your next action. Nightcrawler has three different grounded attacks. Neutral, Crouching, and Upward. These each have their uses, but they leave you stuck in place, so more often your aerial attacks will be used. While in the air, Nightcrawler has five different kicks he can perform. Up, Down, Sideways, Diagonal Down, and Neutral. They're performed just as you expect. While in the air, press a direction on the D-pad together with the attack button. Under most conditions, with the exception of the Upward Kick, only one kick can be performed in a single jump. Down and down diagonal may be held until you hit the ground or an enemy, or may be released early. The downward attacks also allow you to pogo off of enemies or destructible objects. You can perform another kick afterwards, or a double jump if you haven't used it yet. Neat. If you press the attack button while in the air and next to a wall or ceiling, Nightcrawler can stick to it and climb. Pretty handy in the speedrun in a few places. More on that later. Nightcrawler's mutant power is teleportation. Which sounds amazing for a speedrun, but it has its limitations. You can teleport in the eight directions on the D-pad, or in place, and you can charge it up to travel a further distance. It can be used to damage enemies and objects, but is used infrequently for this purpose in the speedrun due to its slow speed and limited range. Unfortunately, you can't teleport past walls or barriers, only through open space, and you appear to be limited to a range just beyond what the camera can see. Finally, only one teleport may be performed before landing on the ground. Sadly, sticking to a wall or ceiling doesn't reset this. Okay, now that we're through the basics, let's move into more advanced options for Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler Advanced Movement When performing a sideways kick with Nightcrawler, you get a sudden burst of speed, but if you continue to hold the D-pad, you will quickly decelerate to his normal airspeed, which is much slower. To keep as much speed as possible, release the D-pad as soon as you can after the kick starts. Look at how much faster this is. This may feel weird at first, but you'll get used to it. With that mechanic in mind, let's move into the super jump. The super jump serves as the foundation for the whole run. It allows you to lock in the high horizontal movement speed you get from a sideways jump kick and keep that speed until you land. You perform the super jump by executing a rising sideways kick, quickly releasing all of the buttons and the D-pad, and then just when the kick ends, press and hold the attack button. You'll know that you've done it right if you see Nightcrawler locked into this pose. If you see a pose like this, you've pressed attack a bit late and lost some of your speed. Not optimal, but better than missing altogether. Something else to watch out for is this. If you press and hold attack on the first frame the kick ends, Nightcrawler's fall speed will suddenly max out. I find it hard to perform this consistently, so I've not tried to incorporate it into the run. Most of the time, it just causes unexpected trouble when I do it by accident. Try it out though, and see what you think. You can end super jump early by releasing the kick. Useful in a few places. Get good at this. Being able to do it consistently will completely change your run. Also, it's frickin' rad. The super jump will be your go-to when covering horizontal distance in clear spaces, but it's not always the best option for every situation. An example is when you need a little bit of extra height. That's where the super double jump comes in. The inputs are exactly the same as the super jump, but instead of pressing attack a second time, you hit jump again instead. Couldn't be easier. The downside of the super double jump is that you only retain your speed until the end of the double jump at which point you fall nearly straight down. For this reason, I suggest mainly using it when you'll land at a point that is higher than where you started. I know there's a lot to consider when deciding which of your many options to use while in the air. Don't worry, there's a section later on that will cover that. 
there are a few spots in the run where you'll need to climb a long section of wall. A fast way to do this is to perform a wall cling, hold the d-pad in the direction of the wall, press and hold jump, then spam the attack button. Wolverine is the secondary character for the run, and is mostly used for boss fights due to his high potential damage output. Wolverine Mechanics Wolverine also has a double jump, but unlike Nightcrawler, it slows down your airspeed slightly. Also, you're able to initiate a double jump up to just past the peak of your jump, which, combined with Wolverine's slightly lower gravity, makes it feel like you can get a ton of hang time. Wolverine has three attacks on the ground as well, with his neutral attack being a two-hit combo. Of the three, I find the crouching attack most useful due to its speed. He has three attacks in the air, a normal slash that can also be done while moving left or right, but unlike Nightcrawler does not provide a speed boost, an upward attack, and a downward attack that may be held, but also unlike Nightcrawler does not result in a pogo. Wolverine's mutant ability is a lunging attack that propels you forward. When performed on the ground, it's slower than your base run or air speed, but in the air, it's Wolverine's fastest movement option. What makes this attack incredible, though, is that when you have yellow health, full or near full health, it does 8 units of damage, which is 4 times his normal damage. This makes it tied for the strongest attack in the game, only matched by Beast's Ground Pound, which is too slow and has too limited a range for practical use. The speed from a jumping lunge can be preserved in a way similar to the super jump. To perform, jump in the air and initiate a lunge. Release forward on the d-pad if you are holding it, then when the lunge animation ends, double jump or execute any aerial attack. The effect appears to be slight when compared to Nightcrawler. However, this is a somewhat less explored area outside of the task. In runs, I most commonly use the downward attack, since it can be held and is useful when you are landing at a lower level than where you started. The double jump option may have some potential, but the timing is pretty tight. Remember, you can only double jump just past the peak of your first jump, but you also can't double jump during the lunge animation, so you've only got a small window. Give it a try and find something that works for you. Like Nightcrawler, Wolverine can climb walls and ceilings, and can also perform the fast wall climb. Lastly, Wolverine has his healing factor. It appears that every 15 seconds, the game performs a check. If Wolverine is below 3 health, he'll recover 1 unit of health. I don't recommend relying on it, but it can come in handy sometimes. Alright, we're just about ready to go into level-specific info. A few last notes, though. General Game Mechanics I mentioned earlier that Wolverine's special attack is improved by having yellow health. This is actually true for all characters, though they aren't all affected in the same way. With yellow health, Nightcrawler's teleport attack goes from doing 1 unit of damage to 4. There are key points in the run that require yellow health, so practicing your route carefully to avoid damage and knowing where to find backup health is super important. There are three different health pickups in the game. A 1 unit heal, 3 unit heal, and a full heal. If you complete a level with yellow health, you'll carry that over to the next level. Otherwise, you'll be healed up to max red health. An important part of keeping your health up is taking advantage of iframes. In this game, when you land a hit on an enemy or a destructible object, you are given a brief window of invulnerability. It's surprising some of the situations you could make it through quickly and without taking damage. Another factor is camera control. Few events in this game are on a global timer. More commonly, events or actions are triggered when they come within the camera's view. Since the camera follows your character, you have some control over when certain things happen. This is especially true since it tries to focus in front of your character, so you can see what's just ahead. Keeping your back turned to where you plan to go next can delay certain events and make the way safer. I'll point out a few examples once we get into level specific details. Okay, you now have a lot of tools to work with. How do you know what to use and when? Decision making. You'll have to refine this with practice and by memorizing the levels, but here's the general order that I prioritize options. If a super jump can cover the full distance and I can land safely, that is often what I'll go for. This is the fastest way to cover ground and, for me, has the highest priority. A super double jump is the perfect option in a lot of situations where a normal super jump won't reach a platform or would cause you to run into an enemy. I prioritize this second. The super jumps are a commitment. You immediately spend your one aerial kick right as you leave the ground, making landing more dangerous. Sometimes neither of the super jumps are appropriate because of level layout or enemy placement. 
If a ceiling is too low, you won't have room for super jumps. You'll just bonk your head. In cases where there's an enemy in the way, it may make sense to instead land with a kick to either kill the enemy, pogo off their head, or get iframes. Sometimes the end of a platform is near, and it would be faster to land near the edge and walk off for another quick kick. In cases where you need to move a short distance to position for your next jump, running is sometimes the best option. Similarly, if you need to hop over an enemy to position for your next jump, a quick double jump into a diagonal downward kick will do. Finally, there's teleport. Sadly, because it's so slow, there are only a few places I consider it useful. It's reserved for points that allow you to skip large sections of a level, and I'll note those points later on. Once you get started with practice or runs, and you find that you're not sure how to handle a certain section, I suggest checking out my individual level playlist. It has recordings of some of my fastest times completing each level. Also check out the video descriptions. I've left some notes on why I do certain things and also note where I could have chosen a better option for a situation. I believe these will serve as a good starting point until you find even better ways to clear these levels. Alright, we've covered all of the core, general use mechanics. Learning these and knowing when to apply them will get you through 90% of the run. Next up, I'll fill in that final 10% by covering level-specific strategies for each of the 22 stages. But before we do that, I want to mention that the info I present in this video is built upon the findings from the folks that completed the two assisted runs of X-Men 2. Truncated, Sonic Star, and Slash Star Dash. And also those that originally developed the speedrun, R.G. Gibson and Hydeman. If you want to pour over the numbers, for things like acceleration, max speed, and damage values, there's a link in the description to documentation of their findings. Siberia. Something unusual about this game is that you can't choose your starting character. Just keep resetting, both the game and your timer, until you get Nightcrawler. This first level is excellent for practicing many of your movement options and knowing when to use them. Sentinel-1. You'll be in the Sentinel Factory for the next three levels. The ceilings are low in most places, so this will limit use of the super jumps. To open the locked doors, you need to break these electrical boxes. Some can be hit through the floor to save time. For some reason, you can't climb the walls here, but you can stick to the door frames. If you miss the elevator at the end, just do a super double jump and teleport upwards. Sentinel-2. Mostly the same routine as Sentinel-1. After breaking this electrical box, I pause a moment to let the door above open. If you do this, the door will remain open until you reach it. You can finish the level early by getting Nightcrawler low enough to trigger the exit one floor below. I first try to do this by initiating a super jump, bonking my head, then releasing kick at the correct time. A backup and beginner friendly strat is to line up here, perform a full hop, and kick this diamond on the way down. You should get it within a few tries. Sentinel Core. First boss fight, just duck, spam punch, and teleport when you need to avoid the eyeball lightning. During the escape, the flame pillars are triggered by the camera, so keep that in mind as you plan your movements. In many places, it's worth it to eat the damage from the fire to keep moving. It's up to you how much you want to risk. Okay, as I'm working on this video, a new skip has been discovered that pretty much bypasses the entire escape section. Here's what it looks like. Crazy, right? For a clip like this to work, you need to be falling at a high speed and your kick animation has to end at the right time for Nightcrawler's detection box to shift below the floor. This is still new, but here's how I try to set it up. I perform a full hop from the top platform meaning I hold jump until just past the apex of the jump. This gives me consistent speed and positioning for the next step. While falling, I keep my eyes on this platform. I kick just as the base of Nightcrawler's tail passes by the platform. It's a very tight window to get the clip. If you miss it, just hop back up and try again. Avalon 1. Just super jump, and when needed, land kicks to take advantage of iframes. Avalon 2. Carefully map out your super jumps and super double jumps to avoid a lot of headache here. I strongly recommend checking out my individual level video for this. 
Boss fights are one of the few places we use teleport for damage. Line up near the edge and follow this pattern for a safe kill. Another option is to remain grounded and spam teleport, but you risk taking a hit. Avalon 3. Memorization is important here. Kick straight down to progress faster when you can. You can dive kick into the enemies standing near levers, and the iframes should keep you safe. Ideally you'll finish this level with yellow health so you can maximize damage against an upcoming boss. There are only a few health pickups, a 3 unit early on, and 2 single units at the end. Exodus. If you have yellow health, you can do quadruple damage with Wolverine's special attack. Exodus has a simple pattern and you should be able to avoid taking damage. If you don't have yellow health, choose Beast instead. Surprise! We use Beast sometimes because all of his normal attacks do double damage. Magneto. Lead Magneto to the right and dodge his attacks to destroy the final wall. Dodging in this pattern works best for me. At the end, pull the camera all the way to the right before striking him to finish the fight. If you have yellow health, you should be able to finish the fight in one hit. If you attack too early, you may get this. Fortress 1 Near the top of this level, a few platforms are lower than the others. You can reach these with a teleport, and that allows you to skip part of the climb. It is possible to skip lower levels as well, though it's much more difficult. One way is to carefully position and time a pogo off of a falling rock. Another way is to use something called pogo storage, though that way is slower. I'll cover pogo storage in more detail near the end of the guide. Tusk has a weird vulnerability window, but appears to always be open to attack after he charges. This is the method that I use. It's a compromise between speed and consistency. Begin the fight with a crouching punch to line up in range to hit Tusk with teleport for the rest of the fight. From here, continue to time one teleport with a slight charge to dodge his attack, then quickly follow up with a second to damage him. It is possible to both dodge his attack and damage him with a single teleport, but it's difficult to do consistently, and this fight can quickly turn into a mess if you take a hit. If I lose yellow health, I fall back to the old strategy that looks like this. Teleport to dodge his charge, then follow up with a punch. Fortress 2 This may be the most complicated and critical level on the run. Poor execution here can cause a lot of time loss. For that reason, this is another level I recommend you check out the individual level video for. The spike pillars appear to move on a global timer and your objective is to get ahead and stay ahead of certain cycles to save the most time. The pillars do 3 units of damage if you get hit, so watch out. If they're moving towards you, you can teleport past them. There's also a section where you can use iframes from breaking barriers to get past them. Those breakable barriers appear throughout the level and are triggered by the camera. You can skip a few of them with careful camera control. Specifically, I keep my back turned as I fall here, so I don't trigger the first door until I start my kick. Then I do a few landing kicks to safely line up and kick past the second door. Too many enemies on screen will cause lag. This may mess up your timing for super jumps if you aren't ready. Near the end, I think it's worth it to kill some of the enemies to reduce lag. If all that wasn't enough, it's also important that you finish this level with full health for the upcoming boss fight. Luckily, there's a full health pickup near the end of the level. And if you take some hits after getting the full health, there are still a few spots to get backup health. That said, you may want to take intentional damage at points to make a cycle and save time. How much you want to gamble here is up to you, as long as you finish the level with full health. Apocalypse The reason we wanted full health at the end of the last level was so that we could eat damage to destroy the mines Apocalypse sends out. If you instead dodge them, they take 3 laps around the level before blowing up, which delays the next cycle of the fight by several seconds. You'll only take this intentional damage for the first 2 rounds. To advance the fight, destroy these capsules. They'll damage Apocalypse's machine and give you a 1 unit heal. From this point on, dodge the mines and destroy the capsules. If you don't take any more hits, you should be back to yellow health when Apocalypse comes out, and it will only take 8 hits to finish him. 
His movement is easy to manipulate, and if you do it correctly, he won't get to complete a single attack. The easiest way to do this is to delay your lunge until you're very close to him. Pass through and run a short distance, then repeat in the opposite direction before he has a chance to decelerate to attack. This can still be done without yellow health, but will take longer due to reduced damage output. If you allow Apocalypse to complete too many attacks, he will withdraw and start sending out mines again. Savage Lands 1 Nothing too complicated here. Just memorize a path, move well, and avoid all the things that want to damage you. Savage Lands 2 Same as Savage Lands 1, but simpler. Savage Lands 3 it's easy to get hung up by projectiles and lag, but don't get flustered. There are a few shortcuts you can take here. To exit, you have to clear out these blocks. Crouching Punch can take out the bottom six pretty quickly. Savage Lands 4 There's another teleport skip here at the start. You can try to keep some enemies off screen to prevent them from shooting at you. Take advantage of iframes and kick through enemies. There's an alternative route that goes up the right side. It can be a bit tricky, but isn't so bad if you take intentional damage before starting your fast wall climb. Master Brain. Hey, we get to use Beast again. Just spam punch to win. Try and let the boss die off screen to avoid a small bit of lag from the explosions. Use this time to dance. Phalanx 1. Super double jumps simplify a lot of sections in this level. And there's a nice skip here by performing a leap of faith. For the boss, we use the teleport glitch. To execute, jump and perform a kick. Teleport. And before Nightcrawler reappears, press and hold kick again. For some reason, this causes Nightcrawler to hang in the air until kick is released, or you press up. In this state, Nightcrawler has an active hitbox that can damage nearby enemies. Even if the boss is out of health, the fight won't end until you release him from hit stun. To know when to release, you can either count the damage animations to about 23, or you can watch the timer in your splits and count to about 7 seconds. You can end the level slightly early by moving left off screen during the death animation. Phalanx 2 from the time you press start to select your character, you are in for a 2 minute and 4 second wait for the boss to appear. Note the time when you enter the level, so you know when to expect the boss to enter from the left side. Until the boss arrives, just kill drones and collect health to keep yourself in yellow. All it takes is 2 hits to finish the fight. If you find a way to make this level faster, let me know. Phalanx 3 Things really ramp up here with enemy spam so have a planned route and practice it. It's easy to take a lot of damage and lose a lot of time here. Scout out backup health and take short detours to get it when needed. Phalanx 4 Like the last level, but times 2. And you also need to finish with yellow health. In some areas, I think it's worth it to kill enemies to reduce lag, or to avoid taking damage. There are a ton of enemies, but also a lot of health pickups. As always, make the most of iframes. This final section is critical. A mistake here that costs you yellow health will kill your run. You can blast through quickly using iframes, but you still risk taking a hit. If you want to play it safe, you can use teleport instead. Clone Factory. Here's what we needed yellow health for. The Brood Fight. Dodge attacks until you reach a wall. The boss will charge the wall and crack open its weak spot. To finish the fight in one cycle, this is the method I prefer. Jump over the second charge while facing away from the boss, and release the D-pad. Just before landing, perform a lunge away from the boss. You should be able to land a hit even though the boss is behind Wolverine. Turn in place towards the boss and lunge twice to finish the fight without taking damage. This method is a bit trickier, but you can do it while missing a unit of health. The alternative method is to hold left when the wall breaks, then spam lunge to the right. Easier to perform, but you'll take a hit after the second lunge, so you'll need full health to finish the fight in one cycle. Next up is taking out clones of each of the X-Men. 
Ideally, you keep yellow health for the rest of the level. There are three single unit health pickups here, and six three unit health pickups back here if you need them. Because the health pickups are concentrated in a few locations, it's important that you avoid taking damage while traversing the level to avoid backtracking. Have a planned and practiced route. Controlling camera position can help avoid triggering damaging enemy actions. With yellow health, the clones can be taken out with four hits. Hits one and two can be spaced out, but try to land hits three and four in quick succession. If you fail to do so, they will go through a transformation phase and perform a lengthy attack. Before their death animation can begin, they have to be standing next to you, so don't run away at the end. Here are some quick notes on the clones in the order I fight them in. Cyclops. Easy one to warm up on. I lunge from left to right to start, then chase with three lunges to the left. All lunges can be performed on the ground. Nightcrawler. For many of these fights, I like to perform a rising lunge, which requires me to change how I hold the controller, pressing buttons with my fingers instead of my thumb. Nightcrawler's punch hitbox lingers longer than you may expect, so watch out. Gambit. Gambit has a long range on his attack, so you'll want to initiate the lunge pretty close to him so that you get out of range sooner. I also favor a slightly slower attack sequence that makes Gambit's movements consistent. Here I do attacks 1 and 2 in quick succession to start. That will cause Gambit to perform a crouching attack in the center. I can then line up for my final two attacks. If instead I land my second attack too late, Gambit continues to run around. This can save a small amount of time, since we don't wait on the crouching attack, but the risk of taking a hit is higher. Wolverine Wolverine is a bit shorter, and I find it hard to land my first hit. I try to picture the lunge hitbox starting from the shoulder, and get that to overlap with Clone Wolverine before my attack. The remaining hits feel easier to land. Psylocke. Like Gambit, Psylocke has long range on her attacks. I think it's worth running with her to get close before attacking to avoid taking damage afterwards. Beast. Beast is even lower to the ground than Wolverine, so I don't go with rising lunges against him. Instead, I do a full hop and lunge through him on the way down. Like Nightcrawler, be careful not to run into his fist. Landing the final two attacks in quick succession is tricky. You have very little time to pull it off. You can practice the timing, but in addition to that, what helps me is to perform the input for a downward aerial attack in between the final two lunges. I don't think there's even enough time for that middle attack to come out, so it may just be that it helps me with the timing. Or maybe it gets me to the ground more quickly, or terminates the previous animation sooner or something. I don't know, but it works for me. And that's it! The end of the Any% run. Just watch the explosions and stop the timer when the screen fades out. Good job. We've covered all of the techniques and strategies I've used in runs to this point. Before we call it a video, I want to note a few ways that someone may push the run further. Some of this may not be practical or useful, but we won't know until they're explored further. Floor Clip we covered this earlier when escaping the Sentinel Factory, and it seems there are three requirements to clip through floors. Fall with enough speed, kick at the right time, and have a thin enough floor. I know that this can also be done in the Savage Lands, but there may be other places we haven't thought to use it yet. Fast Fall I mentioned earlier that inputting a super jump on the earliest possible frame will max out Nightcrawler's fall speed. If someone could execute this consistently, that could be useful in certain situations. I don't think the reward is worth the risk, but I include it here for completeness. Pogo Storage We got a preview of this in Fortress 1. To set this up, you need to take damage while performing an attack that can pogo off of enemies without the pogo occurring. So, Nightcrawlers and Beast Downward Aerials. For some reason, your character will remain in a pogo-ready state, and the next attack you land in the air will result in a pogo, even if it doesn't normally pogo. The only practical use I've seen for this so far is to skip floors in Fortress 1, but even then, it's slower than the other strategy of pogoing off the falling rocks. I mentioned pogo storage here because there may be uses for this tech we haven't found or thought of yet. Rock Skip Speaking of pogoing off those rocks, we have yet to find a consistent setup to skip floors with this. If anyone finds one, that's 10 or more seconds saved. Teleport Storage If you charge Teleport, pause, release the Teleport button, then unpause, 
teleport will remain charged without having to hold the button. Normally, you can't double jump while charging teleport. Teleport storage allows you to work around this. I don't know how this may be used to save time, but it can simplify some of the tricky teleports in the run. Okay, that's it for real now. Thank you for watching this guide. I hope you decide to give the run a try and enjoy it as much as I do. I would be happy to discuss any questions you have as you get started, whether that's in the comments here, in Discord, or in my stream or yours. Alright, see you guys.